Hi, my name is Jen Malava. I'm the lead naturalist for Burlington County Parks. This presentation is about some of the invasive species of insects that have made their way to New Jersey. In this presentation, you'll learn how to recognize them, how they got here, why they're so destructive, and what we can do to try to help diminish their spread. Now, if you saw the presentation I gave on invasive plants and fungi, it's kind of what I consider part one to this series on invasive species, and these slides will look very familiar from the introduction. But if you didn't see it, it's not a problem because they're repeated here. So as you can see, native plants and animals are naturally balanced by predator-prey relationships. And that makes perfect sense. But when we have non-native plants and animals, there are no natural predators or parasites to keep them in check. And this is how some exotic species can become invasive. And the definition of an invasive species is that which causes harm to the environment, economy, or human health. They definitely disrupt the delicate balance of ecosystems. So not all exotic species are invasive. Of the 50,000 alien species of plants and animals in the U.S., about 5,000 are considered invasive. Invasive species of animals are able to reproduce without any kind of predator control, and therefore they can decimate very large areas very quickly. For instance, entire forests or entire croplands. Most of the time, the invasive animals that we're talking about are insects, but they could be any kind of foreign animal, and that includes aquatic creatures like fish and mussels and released exotic pets like snakes and caged birds. So how did exotic species get here in the first place? There's many ways that they are introduced. A lot of our plants and plant seeds were brought over by early settlers from other countries, either on purpose or by accident. Another way that a lot of non-native species, especially plants, got here is by infested cargo in ships' ballast water. Many invasive species first arrive in a new area on huge cargo ships that travel back and forth across the ocean. Ships take on ballast water in their home port. The weight of this water makes the ships stable when they travel across the ocean. When a ship gets to its destination, it releases the ballast water. And that ballast water is teeming with living creatures that were in the water at the port on the other side of the globe. So the zebra mussel, which is native to the Caspian and Black Seas, arrived in Lake St. Clair between Michigan and Ontario in the ballast water of a transatlantic freighter in 1988. And within 10 years, it had spread to all of the neighboring five Great Lakes. The economic cost of this introduction of zebra mussels has been estimated by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service at about $5 billion. Sometimes when people don't want their exotic pets, they simply release them into the environment, which is certainly not good for the native animals or the, the pet. And people also dump their unwanted aquariums, both the creatures and the water, which can certainly introduce non-native species into the environment. The primary way most of the invasive species have gotten here to New Jersey is from importing all kinds of natural materials, mostly plants for landscaping, as well as things like food and wood and other natural materials. And so the milder climate that we are experiencing now is actually allowing species to expand their range further than they would have before.
with all the invasive species of animals that are found here now, it's certainly difficult to narrow it down to just a few to talk about in one presentation. There's so many animals that I didn't want to do a slideshow on invasive animals as a whole because there's, as I said, so many. We'd, we'd count birds and snakes and fish and so forth. And then there are, of course, so many species of imported insects. So for the purposes of this presentation, I have narrowed it down to basically six species that are increasingly damaging our local environment. I'm going to start with Japanese beetles. Japanese beetles first appeared in the U.S. in 1916 when Henry Dreer of Riverton, Burlington County, who was a nurseryman, placed an order of Asian irises. But Henry didn't know that Japanese beetle larvae were among the roots of his plants until they emerged as adults. They quickly spread with no natural predators to keep them in check and millions of acres of lawn continued to dominate the U.S. landscape. And it turns out the beetle larvae develop on the roots of grass, mostly. The adults eat over 400 plant species, leaving only the veins remaining. They can spread mostly by flying or by moving the plant or the soil in which the grubs are in. In late spring and fall, since the beetles have two life cycles per season, there are different kinds of control for Japanese beetles. You can use two tablespoons of liquid dishwashing soap diluted in one gallon of water per 1,000 square feet if you need to treat a lawn area. That should be applied about once a week until no more grubs are appearing. Obviously don't apply any kind of spray during hours when you see any kind of pollinators like bees visiting nearby flowers. These are some other control methods for Japanese beetles including the milky spore fungus disease for treating grubs on lawns, parasitic nematodes for grubs and lawns, obviously just simply hand removal of adults on your garden plants or flicking them into a bucket of soapy water, and planting strategically. So putting something like garlic near your plants that are getting eaten in order to deter the adults. And finally, this is a map of the Japanese beetle distribution in the U.S. You can see very heavy infestation in the eastern half of the country. Next is the hemlock woolly adelgid. This is a microscopic aphid that sucks the sap from hemlock trees. Hemlock trees are typically found in the northern half of New Jersey. But if you live in southern New Jersey, you might have them planted in your yard as well. The hemlock woolly adelgid first appeared in Virginia in 1950 on ornamental stock from Japan. These insects are lethal to our eastern hemlocks, which have no natural defense and nothing to keep them in check. Both adults and the nymphs suck the sap from the twigs. As the adelgids feed, they create these woolly casings around themselves and their eggs, which can be seen year round, but they're most abundant in the spring. As the insect grows and feeds, the woolly casing expands as well. When the adelgid is feeding, it is sucking the sap, and so eventually the needles will dry, turn a grayish green color, and then finally fall from the tree. The buds are also killed. Die back progresses from the bottom of the tree upwards. 
If you're looking for this particular pest, they're generally present from March through July. They can be dispersed many ways. For instance, wind, birds, deer, and other mammals, including people. Movement of hemlock in the Northeast at any time of the year is restricted. Never move live hemlock and do not hang bird feeders on hemlock trees. A homeowner can mechanically remove both eggs and adults by spraying twigs with high pressure water or pruning the infested twigs and also spraying with horticultural oils. Visual inspection of the twigs should be checked about twice a year at the beginning and end of daylight savings time. So hemlocks are really important forest trees found through all the entire pretty much eastern US and the hemlocks create distinctive microclimates. The density of hemlocks influences temperatures, light levels, and even the amount of precipitation that reaches the ground. All 26,000 acres of hemlock stands in New Jersey are infested to some degree with hemlock woolly adelgid, some worse than others. Fortunately, there is an interesting biological control method that has saved many of the remaining hemlocks. There was a lot of initial research that went into finding a host-specific predator in Japan. And after decades of testing, the little ladybug that you see pictured in the bottom left, since 1999, over two and a half million of these adults have been reared by five labs and released in 15 states. I happen to have worked in one of those labs in New Jersey. So I remember very well taking care of these little beetles. They're only about one millimeter in length, about the size of a poppy seed. These little beetles eat only woolly adelgid and have a specialized mouth part for capturing the woolly adelgids out of the woolly casing. So now the sustained biological control is the primary method for controlling woolly adelgid across wide swaths of forests. These maps from the U.S. Forest Service show the initial spread of the hemlock woolly adelgid through the primary eastern hemlock forest following the Appalachian Ridge from Maine to Georgia. And here is another map that shows the progression and the years and the spread of hemlock woolly adelgid. Unfortunately, there's a second species known as balsam woolly adelgid, very, very similar to hemlock woolly adelgid, but this one infests and kills the Fraser fir, which is one of the dominant trees in the southern Appalachians found at high elevations. So if you hike the Appalachian Trail area, particularly of the Smoky Mountains, these are my pictures from the top of Clingman's Dome. And you can see all of the dead Fraser firs as a result of the balsam woolly adelgid. Next is the gypsy moth. This moth is native to Europe and was first brought here by a man who was interested in breeding a better silkworm and he brought it from France and introduced it into Massachusetts in 1869. And some of the moths escaped his lab and went, got into the neighborhood and quickly became established. And of course the moths caterpillars eat over 300 species of trees and shrubs, including birch, cedar, cottonwood, fruit trees, poplar, willow, and especially oaks. 
The caterpillars will defoliate the trees, which leaves the trees vulnerable to diseases and other pests. And if they continue to defoliate the trees in successive years, then the tree will die. We see that there are different densities of gypsy moths from year to year, and populations can quickly erupt every five to 10 years. And in Burlington County, we saw the last eruption in the years of 2007 to 2011. That's when we, we lost almost all the, the oaks in our Burlington County parks because it was so many years in a row the trees couldn't recover. And there's been some heavy infestations in certain Pinelands townships in 2012, 15, 17, and 18, but nothing like we saw as far as the widespread devastation between 2007 and 2011. And some of this has to do with rain. So if we don't get a lot of precipitation, it doesn't, it's not the right conditions for this particular fungus that kind of keeps them in, in check. So when it doesn't rain, gypsy moths can flourish and bring with them their own terrible kind of precipitation. If you've ever been in the woods when gypsy moths are feeding in large numbers, not only bits of leaves, but their excrement uh, from the from them chewing. Uh, basically, their their poop comes down from the canopy, and it's absolutely disgusting. The visible egg masses you can see in the picture in the top right are kind of covered with a fuzzy yellowish hair, and that comes from the the female's abdomen, and they can range from about one and a half inches long to three quarters of an inch wide. The caterpillars we're going to look at on the next slide. It's very important to be able to recognize them distinctly from other native caterpillars. But um, the biological control for large-scale forests has been predominantly uh, a bacteria known as Bt which uh, is effective against gypsy moth, but it is not specific to gypsy moth. It kills any caterpillars of any butterflies or moths. There's also a viral pathogen called gypcheck, and they are, there's also things known as pheromones that can act as mating disruptors to try to control gypsy moths naturally. Homeowners should carefully inspect all anything they have, any kind of out, outdoor household furniture or, or other belongings for egg masses, like the ones you see in the picture, the fuzzy egg masses, and remove, scrape them off into a bucket of soapy water and destroy any you find. So here are pictures of the rest of the gypsy moth life cycle. You saw the egg masses in the previous slide that were fuzzy. So those, the newly hatched caterpillars are generally dark, black, and hairy. The later stages of the caterpillars develop a more mottled pattern on their body with very distinctive tufts of red and then red and blue tufts along their back, which is very distinctive and different from our native caterpillars. And then the adult moths look a lot like our, a lot of other moths in our area. Males are darker, and the females are paler with um, the more whitish color with a little bit of a sawtooth pattern on their wings. The caterpillar that we have every spring that's native is the eastern tent caterpillar. You can see it's hairy, and it has these spots that look kind of like eyes. And this is the most commonly mistaken for a gypsy moth. But as I said, this tent caterpillar is native and it only affects trees in the cherry and apple genus. After the tent caterpillars go through that part of their life cycle, the leaves on the tree can grow back. So 
it's nowhere near as problematic or destructive as, as it certainly is gypsy moths. This, these pictures show the tent, the silken tent that they make when the caterpillars are active and the adult for comparison. And here is again a picture of the gypsy moth caterpillar. So you can see the difference between the one on the left, which is our tent caterpillar that looks kind of like eye spots and the gypsy moth that has those red and blue tufts. Now even a simple Google search for gypsy moth caterpillars turned up some very incorrect identifications. And here's an example of one of the ones I found very easily. You can see this picture was labeled gypsy moth infestation and it's clearly eastern tent caterpillars. You can see the tent and you can see these are not gypsy moths. So you cannot trust images that you see online. Uh, a lot of them are wrong. And finally, here is the map showing the distribution of the European gypsy moth, ranging from Maine to Virginia, west to Wisconsin and Michigan. Next is the brown marmorated stink bug. This arrived in Pennsylvania around 1998, but it wasn't fully detected until um, basically the mid-2000s when widespread outbreaks were reported. This particular insect is in the stink bug family and it's native to China, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. It was likely to have been accidentally introduced having hitched a ride as a stowaway in packing crates. The nymphs and adults of this insect feed on a wide variety of over 100 species of plants. Many of them are agricultural crops, unfortunately. They include things like apples, apricots, pears, cherries, corn, grapes, lima beans, peaches, peppers, tomatoes, and soybeans. The fact that they can feed on so many plants makes them versatile and quite dangerous since they don't require a specific kind of plant to feed on. To attain their food, stink bugs will insert their mouth part into the plant tissue and begin to extract the plant fluids. And when they do that, basically it causes Sometimes the deformation of seeds, the destruction of seeds, and fruiting structures, but mainly when the stink bug is feeding, it creates the dimpling of the fruit surface and then rotting of the material underneath. The most common signs of stink bug damage are pitting and scarring of fruit, leaf destruction, and a mealy texture to the harvested fruits and vegetables. So in most cases, the signs of stink bug damage makes the plant unsuitable obviously for sale in the market as the inside is often mealy or not edible. It doesn't necessarily kill a, a plant. Now because of the potential destruction to uh, the agricultural industry this has become a priority for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So there is an artificial pheromone, uh, which is basically the scent of their hormone that is used to, to bait trap them. Uh, because the bugs, when they insert their mouth parts into the surface of the fruit, uh, insecticides are actually ineffective um, because it's not just on the surface that they're feeding. They're feeding on the inside of the fruit. So these pheromone traps have been pretty successful. And now we're starting to see native birds and insects starting to eat them. Here are some picture examples of the different parts of the brown marmorated stink bug's life cycle. These photos are showing, of course, the eggs uh, in the formation that they're laid on the back of leaves, and then the nymphs that are hatching. 
then as the nymphs grow, they go through intermediate stages called instars. So you can see in these pictures that they change quite a lot in appearance as they grow through the nymph part of their life cycle. Unfortunately, there are quite a lot of native stink bug lookalikes. So they can, these insects can easily be confused with, as you can see, all these native lookalikes, but the best identification for the adults is the, the wide bands that are white on the antenna as marked in the pictures. And they also have white bands on their legs. And then they have those alternating dark and light bands on the margins of their abdomen. Now, again, a lot of our native ones you can see do have an alternating pattern. But they're not as distinct black and white and you need to look for the combination of those bands with the antenna bands. So I put some, some native lookalikes next to the invasive ones on the bottom for comparison. The brown marmorated stink bug is more likely to invade homes in the late fall than other members of the stink bug family that are native. So as I mentioned, this was first documented in Pennsylvania. So that's where the, our area of the Mid-Atlantic was most heavily affected. And through the efforts of, of researchers, uh, various agricultural growers have kind of been saved by the um, pheromone traps. But in the last several years, while Mid-Atlantic damage isn't as bad, they are certainly spreading west. As you can see in the map, the species is heading towards the Midwestern states and the southern U.S. and uh, doesn't appear to be stopping. Spotted lanternfly is our newest invasive insect pest. It's native to China, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and other parts of Eastern Asia. Unfortunately, one person in Berks County, PA, ordered fancy landscaping stones from Korea. And on those stones were the egg masses of spotted lanternfly. Now they are found in eight New Jersey counties, mostly along the Delaware River, and 26 counties in Pennsylvania, as well as Maryland, uh, Delaware, and Virginia. I'll show you a map in uh, just a few slides. But this insect is, even though it looks very different as it, as it goes through its life cycle and the adults are often confused as moths or some other kind of insect, these are plant hoppers. And plant hoppers, like stink bugs, extract plant sap as they feed with their mouth parts. Plant hoppers are extremely good at jumping and so they can very easily hitchhike onto just about any surface. The insects themselves, you can see, often have uh, bright colors, especially when the spotted lanternfly opens its wings. As an adult, you can see bright red, which indicates that it doesn't taste good. There are toxins inside the insects that they develop as they feed. So many birds and mammals won't eat them. The spotted lanternfly can deposit eggs on any, basically any vertical surface. Their egg masses are gray. I have a picture here. There can be, there's usually about 50, 50 eggs per egg mass, but it doesn't have to be on the trunk of a tree. Sometimes they're on stones, fences, or other materials, which makes them, again, very excellent at hitchhiking. So as I mentioned, spotted lanternfly is a plant hopper, and they feed by extracting plant sap. And so the important thing to understand here is that as the bugs feed, they're really just feeding on sugar water. And so what they excrete is something known as honeydew, 
which in its simplest form is just sugar and water. When they excrete that honeydew, it falls near the base of the tree and around surrounding vegetation and eventually develops uh, a fungus known as sooty mold, which will turn the base of the tree and surrounding vegetation black. At the same time, the honeydew that they're excreting attracts pretty large numbers of insects that like to feed on honeydew, certain kinds of bees, wasps, hornets, etc. So all of this is happening as a result of the insects feeding on the sap. You can see the telltale signs on this tree, which happens to be Tree of Heaven, <clears throat> their preferred host, and one of the most invasive trees <clears throat> in the world, which we'll talk about in just a second. So what you can see are the oozing wounds as a result of the tree of the of the spider lanternfly feeding on the tree. So you see oozing sap in this case. And some trees you might see uh, wilting or leaf curling and some tree dieback. But the important thing to understand is that it weakens the plant but does not kill the plant. But the effects of the mold and everything else that comes with it has some very negative implications for agriculture. This is another photo showing the base of that same tree focusing on the, the mold growth. And these are photos of the surrounding vegetation near that tree. And you can see all that black stuff as a result of the honeydew nearby. So it's on, the, it's on all the leaves, not just the base of the tree. And here is a, another close-up showing of some of the leaves nearby and that black stuff as a result of their honeydew waste product. When I first heard that this insect prefers Tree of Heaven, one of the most invasive trees, I thought, great, eat it all up. But unfortunately, there are at least 125 other host plants that, can, that these insects can feed on in some point in their life cycle. So while Tree of Heaven is their number one preferred plant, number two is grapes. Number three is hops. So if you like wine or beer, you may be in trouble. Basically, spotter lanternfly is a significant threat to local agriculture, especially vineyards and orchards. The insect can result in significant economic impacts. And this is why there are quarantine areas and restrictions for commerce in our area, which I'll touch on in just a few minutes. So again, even though the spotted lanternfly does not kill the plant as a result of feeding, the fruit that's produced is wounded, mealy, or covered in mold, and therefore unmarketable. In this chart from Penn State, you can see the major preferred groups of hosts and when the nymphs and adults are using them to feed. The spider lanternfly only has one full generation in New Jersey, and while they prefer Tree of Heaven, they can complete their life cycle without it. They overwinter in the egg stage, so we will see egg masses anywhere from late September to late April. In 2019, we certainly had spot on lanternfly appearing in larger numbers in our area of Burlington County, but 2020 we saw the population absolutely explode and the reporting of spot on lanternflies in New Jersey and Pennsylvania was up 72 percent uh, from the same time last year. So this was really obvious, so they are, they are increasing and spreading in, in drastic numbers compared to just last year. So this video it was taken at Amico Island this summer uh, to give you an idea of just one tree and the infestation that's found there. So once the nymphs hatch from the gray egg case, they are black with white spots 
And those nymphs can be seen generally from the end of April or early May into early July. The, they will look like that, black and with white spots, for the first three stages of their nymph life cycle. But their fourth instar, they turn bright red and with black and white. And that seemed to be the time when most people were seeing them, reporting them, and also killing them. So we, we got a lot of reports um, from people in Burlington County who were confusing a lot of our native lookalikes that happened to be some combination of red and black with the fourth instar nymphs. So this flyer was made to educate people to ensure that they weren't smushing the wrong, the wrong insect. Hopefully this helps others as well. But as I said, the instars, the different stages of the nymphs do overlap one another and the adults overlap the nymphs in the summer as well. We'll look at that next. Here are some photos I took this July where you can see the the red fourth instar nymphs are very prevalent on Tree of Heaven in early July. By late July they were still present but you can see in my photo on the right from July 21st that was the first instance of adults co-occurring with the uh, nymphs at that time. So that was an early, uh, early emergence of the adults there. Most of the adults we'll see in August and September. These are various photos of the adults, as I said, seen uh, mostly in August, September. Uh, but you can see I've, I've photographed them as late as October 19th. So egg laying will begin around mid to late September, and they do prefer Tree of Heaven. Those gray egg masses match the gray bark pretty well, and they can be really hard to see. These are photos from other sources which show terrible infestation of the adults on various types of uh, fruit. You can see grapes in the top and uh, apples, apple trees below, and then more. Uh, on the Tree of Heaven. This is a very updated range map showing the eight counties in New Jersey as well as all the counties in Pennsylvania, Connecticut, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, and West Virginia where spotter lanternfly infestations are present. This map uh, highlights the eight counties in a little more detail, and that they have since been reported in Cape May County as well. Prior to this year, various places all over the so-called quarantine area were asked to report sightings of spot and lanternfly to their associated Department of Agriculture. And now, if you're in one of those quarantine counties of Burlington, Camden, Gloucester, Hutton and Mercer, Salem, Somerset, or Warren, you do not need to contact the New Jersey Department of Agriculture because they know that it's a problem everywhere. So they no longer need those reported sightings. But if you're in one of the unquarantined counties, then you can certainly report your sightings by emailing the address provided here or by calling them. They certainly prefer a, a photograph with the, the location of where it was seen via email. Now there are some other efforts that you can do certainly to help stem the spread of this of this invasive insect. There, while there are a few insects that have been seen uh, as far as predators controlling spotted lanternfly, 
Most of those insects are things like um, praying mantis and certain assassin bugs and spiders. But for the most part, as I said before, uh, mammals and birds are not eating them because they don't, they don't taste good. So there is a graduate student at the at Penn State who's looking for anyone to report if you see birds eating spotted lanternfly. And her Facebook post, Birds Biting Bad Bugs, is, is here for your reference if you would like to uh, be a part of submitting any kind of observations of any particular birds that are eat, that are feeding on these insects. So far, uh, I've actually only, only observed sca scarlet tanagers eating spotted lanternfly. The, the people in the post so far have mostly reported scarlet tanager, Baltimore oriole, and red-bellied woodpecker. As far as other things you can do, obviously carefully inspect all of your outdoor items in your yard, especially your vehicle or anything else that you might be moving before you travel out of your area. You can remove, smash them, or drown them in, in bleach, or make sure they're thrown out and double bagged in the garbage. You can check for egg masses between September and April on really any hard surface, not just tree trunks. You can use a plastic card or a putty knife and scrape them into a container of rubbing alcohol, hand sanitizer, bleach, etc. But from May to October, when you have the nymphs and adults, you need another kind of method. Some, in some places, these sticky traps can be purchased online or at a garden center, but you have to put a wire cage over it in order to avoid catching birds and mammals. There's also many insecticides that have been listed for control against this insect. But as you can see from previous pictures and charts, there are a lot of other high density feedings of bees and other beneficial insects on the trees that are in which the spotted lanternfly is feeding at the same time. So treating trees, especially with sy systemic insecticides, could certainly have residue in the flowers and nectar even the following years. So insecticide treatment is dangerous to non-target beneficial insects and certainly not recommended. The, uh, some of, there are some treatment options that I've listed here, which you can click on these links and look at some uh, do-it-yourself trap ideas. Since the nymphs and, the, and adults walk from the base of the tree up, it's generally effective to put these traps within three feet of the base of the tree. To reduce the tree of heaven populations and the spotted lanternfly populations at the same time, some uh, pest control experts have set up things called trap trees, which is where they remove all the tree of heaven except for just one or two, and then cover those in insecticides. And then when the lanternflies feast on those remaining trap trees, the insects are poisoned and die. And then they eventually remove those remaining trees. The there is a group at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine that's had success when teaching dogs how to sniff out egg clusters before they hatch. Uh, they, they began training the dogs in December 2019, and now they can separate the scent of the eggs from the scent of other things. So they, the dogs can correctly identify lanternfly egg masses and the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture will be using those dogs to help sniff out egg masses on various vehicles and commercial machinery before they're transported across quarantine boundaries. And finally, here is a map showing those eight quarantined areas for spotted lanternfly. So there are checklists for both residents and businesses if you are traveling 
outside of your area. You can check these lists out on the New Jersey Department of Ag's website. I've provided the links here. It's just, it's just good so you can have an idea of the kinds of things you should look at in your yard or camping equipment or anything that you might be transporting across county and state lines. And the last invasive insect that I'm talking about here is the emerald ash borer. This is another relatively new recent insect that is native to Japan, China, Eastern Russia, and Korea. It was first discovered in southeast Michigan in 2002 in wood used to pack freight. It was first recorded in New Jersey in 2014. The moving of ash logs as firewood and the transport of nursery trees has certainly helped spread the pest further. It's now in 35 states and in New Jersey it's in 100 municipalities and 17 counties. And we'll look at maps in just, just a few minutes. So adult beetles lay eggs in bark crevices and then the larvae then burrow under the bark and feed on the cambium. And the cambium is the part of the tree that transports water and nutrients up and down the tree. So as the larva eats the cambium, it blocks those conductive tissues from transporting the water and nutrients. Therefore, this is really, really deadly and our ash trees are succumbing very quickly. It affects all the true ashes in the Fraxinus genus. The fringe tree, which is also in the ash family, is affected as well, but it's not quite as destructive as it is with the true ashes. The emerald ash borer certainly prefers green ash to white ash, so all of those green ashes that were planted in developments are goners. There might be some isolated forest trees that could survive. Uh, so far right now, all of the white ashes in our parks are dead or dying. This has the, the uh, potential to affect 7.5 billion ash trees in the United States, and already tens of millions have, have already died. The big problem with this is that it's, it's really difficult to detect. It's not like with some of these other insects that you can see easily. The larvae are inside the bark, and by the time it's, there's obvious damage to the tree, it's too late to save the tree. It can take just anywhere from two to four years for the trees to die once the larvae start feeding. And the mortality rate is 99.7. So the 0.3% are now being studied uh, to tell if there's a way to capture that resistance. These are some slides that I borrowed with permission from New Jersey uh, Agricultural Experiment Station Rutgers and uh, this just sh shows examples of how difficult it is to detect this particular pest and how the ash trees, particularly you can see in this, these photos, the green ash and developments will seem perfectly fine. It's showing uh, here 2006 to 2009 uh, and then they're just suddenly dead. So the first indication that there's any kind of infestation of emerald ash borer is probably the increased woodpecker activity. And so while woodpeckers do eat the larvae of this insect, there's unfortunately just not enough birds to make a difference. The woodpeckers leave these very diagnostic holes and markings. So in these pictures, you see where they've knocked the bark off the side of the plate-like bark first, leaving these smooth, light-colored patches, and then drill the holes to get to the larva. 
There are S-shaped markings inside the wood that the larvae leave behind. And then when they emerge, they leave a D-shaped exit hole. Unfortunately, by the time you start seeing the leaves dying back, it's probably too late to save the tree. So with the emerald ash borer, the top of the tree dies first. And then you'll see at the bottom what's known as epicormic sprouts. And that is a, a, just a, an effect of the emerald ash borer starting at the top of the tree and working its way down. Many of our Burlington County parks have ash trees. But the park that has the most ash trees is Crystal Lake Park in Mansfield. And in my efforts to understand this particular pest better, I did some further exploration at Crystal and took these resulting pictures. And I was absolutely horrified to find out just how bad the infestation was, since again, you can't really see it happening. So. In this picture, my husband simply started to remove the, the outer layer of bark and it came off like an orange peel, uh, which obviously should never happen <laughs> on a tree. And when I looked closely at the, just inside the bark, you could see all those S-shaped tunnels caused by the beetle larva. And we can take an even closer look at just how severe that is. These are photos I took of the actual emerald ash borer larva inside the ash trees. And so you can see they're kind of whitish. They have these sort of raised fringed segments along their body, which hopefully helps to separate them from some other similar looking borer larva. So those photos you just saw were taken in April 2020. And by August 2020, all those ash trees along the edge of Crystal Lake you can see in the pictures have no more leaves. The only leaves you see there are those of vines and other things growing on the trees. So that's just right near the parking lot. And um, if we look across the way where the, far the trees are growing along the edge there, all those dead tree branches you see are that of, of ash. So really, like I said, once the cambium is damaged, there's no going back. You can't save the tree. And that means that even using insecticides isn't effective. Because if you just destroy the tissue, the tree can't recover. So cutting of completely dead trees is considered extremely dangerous for workers. Many arborists won't cut a completely dead ash because it's very unpredictable and stem failures of large trees can occur under no load. Therefore, a lot of ash trees are cut before they are completely dead. Now, as I said previously, treatment with insecticides, once the tree has shown major dieback, it's too late. There are several insecticides that are used to treat ashes that are still alive. Now, neonicotinoids are not recommended. These are systemic pesticides that cause lots of damage to non-target organisms. Emamectin benzoate is the recommended insecticide by the New Jersey Forest Service, and it is applied by trunk injection every two to three years, depending on the size of the tree, from either May to June or September to October. 
and since it's not known how long the treatments would go on for, that could be very expensive and it has to be done every other year. The only good thing is that ash does not have insect pollinated flowers or animal dispersed seeds like a lot of the other plants that we uh, talked about in this particular presentation. There's also a biological control treatment that's being tested right now. There's been some study plots in various parts of the eastern U.S. showing that a parasitoid wasp from Asia that's host specific to emerald ash borer has shown some good results. So this is a wasp that lays its eggs in the larva of the emerald ash borer. Very, very tiny. And it, it only impacts the emerald ash borer species. This is only used in forest blocks greater than, than 40 acres of ash. And so far, New Jersey has been getting uh, some of these wasps from a lab in Connecticut, and there's a few release study sites in New Jersey. I have investigated the chances of using those in Burlington County parks, and so far our trees are basically too far gone to make it worthwhile. In order to help stem the spread of this terrible insect, please monitor your trees. Know the signs of emerald ash borer at the very beginning with the woodpecker holes. Do not move firewood of any kind around. And if you do see any insects of any, in any stage of their life cycle, report them to the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. So this is the U.S. map showing its spread uh, in 35 states. And in New Jersey, as of December 2019, the only counties it was not present in were Salem, Cumberland, Cape May, and Atlantic counties. So throughout this presentation, I think we can agree that there are serious economic costs uh, with regards to our certainly our local agriculture, the loss of our a lot of our native plants and certainly forest trees as a result of these insect uh, infestations. And other than that, I think we should also realize that there are many long lasting impacts to the environment, wildlife and the surrounding environment. Over 70% of forests in the eastern U.S. are gone and a lot of our area here has been converted to blacktop in the lower 48. About 40 million acres are suburban lawn. And what is remaining is what we call islands or habitat fragments where wildlife are forced to live. And ecologically, that's not sound, doesn't really work for most wildlife needs. In order to control some of these invasive species, it's not easy. Yeah, we can hand remove or squash some insects we see at our house, but overall it's it's really intimidating when you think about the how widespread some of these invasive insects and also plants are. So chemical control is often needed in all sorts of pesticides meaning herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, etc., are needed to control whatever kind of invasive species we may have. And although chemical use can be effective, they can be very dangerous to other species or to the ecosystem in general. And so they need to be used in a very careful and sound manner. 
trying to use chemicals that are low risk yet effective that can be applied when the pest is at its most vulnerable. Also, we've seen cultural management in the manipulation of the habitat in ways that increase the mortality of invasive species or reduce its rate of increase or damage through the processes of things like flooding, burning, or crop rotation. And finally, biological control, and that is basically what we talked about in many of the cases using an, a biological predator or a parasite or a pathogen to control the spread of the invasive species. But all of those methods cost money. It's estimated that the cost of exotic invasive species to the American economy are now over $138 billion per year. Unlike chemical pollutants that can be eliminated from use and eventually break down the environment, invasive species, like the ones we talked about here, are biological pollutants that can reproduce and spread, causing ever-increasing problems unless they are prevented or at least controlled. So overall, I think the message is very clear that we need to stop importing exotic natural materials and we as individuals can choose not to support the companies that sell these products. We can certainly be more conscious of our actions when we're outdoors or traveling from one place to another. Supporting organizations that control the spread of invasive species, there's quite a lot of nonprofits and agencies in our area that do so. If we want a healthy diversity of animal species, we have to encourage a healthy diversity of plants. By planting native plants, we provide animals with the food and shelter they need while ensuring that non-native plants don't become invasive and harbor non-native pests. And finally, reporting any invasive insects when necessary as described previously. So even though it was difficult to narrow it down to just a handful of invasive insects, I hope the information here was valuable and something you can use to help control the spread of some of these invasive insect species. So thank you so much for watching.